coming up on Access Tech Live. Canon bring images to life. Microsoft's Ability Summit. And we preview the CSUN Assistive Technology Conference. This is Access Tech Live with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. The latest in tech and accessibility every week. Follow us now and get involved at Access Tech Live. Hey everyone, welcome to another Access Tech Live. I am Stephen Scott and Marco Flalo is back with me again this week. We're back in the studio this week after a quick March break from Mark and uh, lots of hard work involved for me. Hmm. Uh, Mark, did you have a nice <laughs> relaxing time off? Uh, nope, not at all. Okay, cool. Um, we'll move on. Uh, coming up on today's show, Canon is bringing pictures to life in a tactile way. Lawrence Gunther is a conservationist who happens to be blind and has experienced it and will be joining us. Plus, Matthew Faulkner from Canon will be joining us as well to talk about the programme. Now, CSUN, as you heard in the uh, headlines at the top of the show, is an amazing accessibility conference that happens every single year. It starts next week. Managing Director Julia Santiago will join us to preview the event. But first, let's get to Mark and those headlines. Now, Access Tech Live headlines. So, Stephen, just hours ago, Elon Musk's company SpaceX successfully launched their Starship vehicle. This is the giant one with a heavy rocket booster from their Starbase launch facility in Texas. This is the third attempt to launch this ship, which will hopefully and eventually transport people to Mars. Not only was the launch itself successful, but it made it into orbit and successfully conducted all of its tests, gathering an amazing amount of data for future launches. Now, the two prior attempts ended in intentional self-destructions roughly about four minutes after launch. So this is a pretty big milestone, not only for the company SpaceX, but for space travel in general. Tomorrow, March 15th, is World Sleep Day, an opportunity to promote sleep health across the world. Apple's on top of it, of course, with great sleep resources in iOS, everything from sleep tracking to sleep reminders, and even a wind down schedule you can create on Apple Watch and iPhone. Post a link to it in our social media for all of the resources. Popular Windows screen reader JAWS, created by Vespero, has launched a new AI service they're calling Picture Smart AI. The new feature allows screen reader users to describe photos using AI when all text isn't available. While Picture Smart itself isn't a new feature, the AI part is, and it's going to add a whole new level of description of images, furthering the accessibility of the service. JAWS users can actually enable that feature now by pressing Alt O in the program window open the options window and then E to select early adopter program. Very, very cool. Microsoft's annual Ability Summit was last week and focused on the advancement of accessibility with AI technology and innovation. The summit highlighted the latest technology and tools for Microsoft, of course, including Copilot for Windows, which makes accessibility easier by enabling new accessibility skills in Windows. Paralympian Lex Gillette was on hand and shared his top seven AI accessibility tools at Microsoft, including Seeing AI, of course, which was designed to help visually impaired people better understand their surroundings. Finally, Stephen, Airbnb is putting guest security first and banning the use of any and all indoor security cameras in owners' homes. Now, the use of indoor cameras have always been allowed and a contentious issue in common areas like living rooms and, and hallways. And the new ban is going to take effect April 30th and restricts them anywhere throughout the entire home after the state reported violations will result in penalties. Big move on Airbnb's part, but definitely something that a lot of people, especially users, Stephen, of those homes have been complaining about, which leads us perfectly into our question of the day, doesn't it? It, it does. And uh, well, I, I want to just quickly uh, just stop you there because okay, World Sleep Day... World yes. Sleep Day, right, okay, I'm sleeping in tomorrow. That is it. I am sleeping in because officially it's allowed. Uh, every tech company demands it of me. Is it allowed, though? I don't know if it's actually allowed or not. We're going to have to check the fine print on the rules. But, yeah, no, I've World Sleep Day is tomorrow. We have, we have, listen, sleep is important. It's an important second to breakfast Absolutely. is probably the most important part of the day, right? Absolutely. I did, and I have recently just set up that sleep schedule on my iPhone, and I love that every night 
about half past ten or even ten o'clock, I get this little chime that goes do do do, and then that's it. And then it, that's it. It tells me it's going into sleep mode, and I love it. And that means I know it's time for bed. Even the dog now knows it's time. For oh, really? Bed. It, it gets up as if to say, "Oh, right, okay, time for bed now. Okay, let's go." And that's it. The night is over. You're just settling down to watch a good film, and the dog's decided it's time for bed, which means, of course, it's time for bed. But no, you're absolutely right. Uh, security cameras in the home is a contentious issue. Um, I've got to say, it is a different thing with Airbnb, I think. I go with this. I don't think there should be an Airbnb homes. I think that you know, we've all seen the horror movies. We don't want that happening in real life. So, you know, I think, um, yeah, this is maybe a good thing on, on the, the part of these uh, companies to perhaps move away from, from having these in the home. But you're right, it does lead us into a rather interesting question that we're putting to you this week, yeah. which is, what is the strangest thing you've captured on your home security cameras? Mm. Could be strange, could be one. funny. Yeah, I mean, I've got mm -hmm. some great funny stories that I'll save for the end of the show uh, that probably will get me in trouble, but uh, we won't uh, get into details that. So the question is, what is the strangest thing you've captured on your home security cameras? I don't know, maybe it's a cat eating uh, something, I don't know, a squirrel trying, who knows? We'll figure it out. Let us know. You can connect with us on all our social media platforms, which are at Access Tech Live. You can also email it to us if you want feedback at accesstechlive.com so you can get involved. You know what? Send us a video if you've got one. That'll be a lot of fun. That'll be fun for the email. Feedback at accesstechlive.com. What is the strangest thing you've caught on those cameras? Stephen, it's the world's largest event dedicated to exploring new ways technology can assist people with disabilities, often referred to as the CSUN Conference. And we've got their interest managing director up next to preview what's coming up at next week's event. Stick around. This is Access Tech Live. There's more Access Tech Live to come. Get involved and have your say at Access Tech Live on social media. We'll be right back. Access Tech Live will return in less than two minutes. Access Tech Live is in a commercial break. Access Tech Live will return in less than two minutes. Access Tech Live is in a commercial break. The show will return in less than a minute. Access Tech Live will be back in 30 seconds. Now, back to Access Tech Live, the latest in tech and accessibility with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. Welcome back to the show. Now, there's one event that takes place in the calendar every year that I get very excited about, and it is CSUN, Mark. Oh, that's fun. And you know what, Stephen, you had a chance to with their interim managing director last week to preview next week's event. Let's take a look at that one. Well, first off, thank you so much for joining us here on Access Tech Live, Julia. Great to have you here. Thank you. It's great. My pleasure to be here. So, you know, it's interesting because I, as a blind guy, I'm well aware of CSUN. I've certainly heard that acronym used many, many times. But, of course, there are many people out there who will not have a clue.
have a clue what CSUN is, so do tell us, what, what is CSUN? Yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's funny, I get this question a lot, or there's a lot of confusion around uh, the name CSUN. Uh, CSUN is actually an acronym, um, it's C-S-U-N, um, and we are a university out in California. Uh, we're a state university, so the CSUN stands for California State University at Northridge, and Northridge is a local town in uh, Los Angeles. And what we are here to talk about today, of course, is the annual conference that happens uh, from CSUN. Uh, tell us about that, and, and tell us about the origins of this. Um, it actually started back in, uh, well, 39 years ago um, with Dr. Harry Murphy, who um, was in my position back then and was really wanting more resources and more development in this area in the field of assistive technology. At the time, there was different people around the world really working on this, but there was never, a, he felt like there wasn't an, a, a great way to communicate, to collaborate, to basically bring all the minds together and try to figure out what the future um, of this field really looked like and how how to to not only define the path, but as well as promote growth in this area and so he his initial thought was to just bring people together bring those great minds together um, the first conference was a small event that took place here at the CSUN uh, University campus um, and from there it grew it grew over the years and to what it has become now um, which is the premier annual event in this field. Um, we um, bring and attract professionals, users, uh, practitioners, um, research and development folks, big companies, um, but essentially stakeholders throughout the world. Um, we're, you know, accessibility and assistive technology, and so we span um, a very comprehensive and diverse uh, representation of within the disability field and um, different types of disabilities, as well as different solutions um, to um, accessibility and assistive technology. And so we uh, have uh, over 300 sessions, I want to say even closer to 400 sessions over the course of the week. Um, and we also have a concurrent running exhibit hall um, with exhibiting companies and organizations uh, showcasing products and services. And we have over 125 exhibitors this year. And so it's going to be a very, very exciting, engaging and full event that we're very much anticipating. Yeah, and you mentioned something that was quite interesting because I often think about CSUN as an event for blindness technology, but as you say, actually, you, you talk about a wide range of disabilities and, and you encourage speakers, you encourage exhibitors to talk about a wide range of, of disabilities at the event, right? Yes, um, you know, we are the Center on Disabilities and we are very comprehensive. There's, you know, and there's a lot of overlap, I think, between, you know, different technology solutions um, and applications, as well as just accessibility in general. Um, but we do see um, a full, actually, um, representation in terms of various um, disability populations, as well as those um, technology solutions and companies that represent uh, solutions for you know a wide range of disabilities. So we're not definitely we're definitely not focused in just one area. Um, and as I said, you know not only is it you know broad in terms of the types of disabilities that um, we have you know we have sessions as well as companies represented um, there, but as well as just within the professional field, uh, those whether it be coming from government and policy to education and uh, rehab professionals to you know engineers and designers and doing um, R and D um, and development of those tools and solutions, and so um, we're certainly not focused in any one area, it's fairly comprehensive. I, I, I think it's interesting because you say you're coming up for your 40th year 
And I think, goodness, what must have that first event been like in that room? What kind of technology were they talking about? I mean, I'm guessing Braille. I'm guessing lots of very um, almost medical class equipment at that time. You probably weren't talking about, I mean, certainly weren't talking about iPhones. I did hear about it. You know, it was certainly not what the conference is today, um, but it was where it started. And as I said, it were brought together, you know, at the time, I think it was fairly focused on academics, um, um, really looking at how to, you know, push the development of these um, products and solutions. And, you know, at some point, as technology grew and improved, um, much of it has become a bit more mainstream than um, than it was back in at that time. In contrast to where where the when the conference started, what th those devices and and items available then, this year we're seeing a lot in the AI uh, arena. Um, so the, you know, still we'll see what's to come. Um, but even that is much more mainstream and seeing how things can translate and overlap um, in the accessibility and the um, AT side of things. And you're absolutely right. I mean, there is a long way to go to what anyone might consider to be accessibility for all. We're not there yet. However, huge progress has been made. And, you know, you can look back in the history of CSUN. You could chart that success, the changes that have taken place that get us to where we, we are today. But interestingly, it feels like there's been some weird inversion here where you know we've gone from having specialist devices that we all talk about, that we focus on, being really good for disabled people because they make our lives better, to mainstream devices being talked about by those disabled people at events like CSUN now. So things have kind of gone full circle, right? We've now got the mainstream involved, but what CSUN does and, and events like it do and this particular conference does, is bring people together to show how disabled people use that mainstream technology, and that's important. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so give us some headlines. What, what's coming up at, at the conference? What can we look forward to? Yes, um, this year is going to be really great. We kick off the um, conference Tuesday, March 19th, um, with our keynote, and this year's keynote is Haben Gurma. She is um, a prominent deaf-blind um, Harvard-educated attorney um, that um, does a lot of work in the advocacy um, of disability rights. Um, so I'm definitely very excited and looking forward to her talk uh, Tuesday morning. Um, as well as throughout the week, we have several networking opportunities. We have the full exhibit hall that opens Wednesday morning um, the 20th. The exciting part about the exhibit hall is that that um, is open and free um, to the public to attend. Um, so there's uh, you can uh, show up and register on the spot and for free and attend the exhibits. Uh, we have accessible karaoke night. Um, we have a welcome reception and just some really great opportunities for people just to have some fun and just network and engage with each other. Well, you'll be glad that I'm not coming because uh, you do not want to hear me do Neil Diamond. <laughs> well, I was going to say, if, if you're not coming um, or, or far away, another really great uh, opportunity to engage um, with us is uh, we last year debuted what we call CSUN ATC TV, uh, which is um, our uh, channel which you can view um, our live stream um, of various uh, content that we have um, at the conference. Um, we have a broadcast studio that we will uh, live stream uh, the keynote address. Um, and in the afternoons each day, we have um, a full schedule of fireside chats. Um, so we have different industry leaders um, engaged in just conversations. So we're definitely looking forward to uh, that full schedule there, and you can connect for free anywhere um, to uh, view uh, that content. Uh, you can connect just by at csun.at slash conference. 
Brilliant. Uh, that sounds like you really don't want me to come and uh, sing Neil Diamond. Um, but... I, I want you to come, please. I would love that. <laughs> uh, Julia, it is wonderful to learn about CSUN, the history of it. I also wish you all the best for the 40th year. Uh, but for now, yeah. for the 39th year, for sure. Julia Santiago, thank you so much for being with us on Access Tech Live. Thank you. That was Julia Santiago. We're going to have a lot of coverage about CSUN over the next week, couple couple weeks, hopefully, uh, with some people heading down on our behalf, gathering some interviews and uh, various things that we hope to bring to you on future shows. When we come back, though, Canon has developed a new technology that's on display in a photography exhibition that invites everyone to experience photography in a new, accessible and immersive way. We're going to learn more after this. There's more Access Tech Live to come. Get involved and have your say at Access Tech Live on social media. We'll be right back. Access Tech Live will return in less than two minutes. Access Tech Live is in a commercial break. Access Tech Live will return in less than two minutes. Access Tech Live is in a commercial break. The show will return in less than a minute. Access Tech Live will be back in 30 seconds. to Access Tech Live, the latest in tech and accessibility with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. Hey everyone, welcome back to Access Tech Live. I am Stephen Scott with Mark Aflalo this week. And uh, also, you know, uh, you know, photography is a huge area of interest as well as all the tech we talk about. Photography is something that everybody loves. Everyone enjoys taking pictures, especially of their face, Mark. People love taking pictures of their face. Uh, but did you know that blind people also enjoy photography too? They do. And you know what? It's interesting because Lawrence Gunther, who's a conservationist and a friend of the show, uh, reached out to me last week and brought a, an interesting story to my attention. Now, Lawrence is coming up a bit later on in the show. But before we get to him, I want to introduce you to our next guest. His name is Matthew Faulkner. He's the marketing director for Wide Format Group for Canon. Uh, Matthew, number one, welcome to Access Tech Live. Thank you for being here. Can you can you please tell us more about this project called Canon's World Unseen? Because it is absolutely astonishing to me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the invitation to be here, Mark and, and Stephen. It's good to meet you. So World Unseen is a, is a Canon project that's based around, I suppose you could say it's Canon's philosophy of, um, we, we believe that imaging has the ability to transform the world. And particularly imaging can be a, an incredible, powerful storyteller, both from everyday subjects, but also things that are a bit more extraordinary. And World Unseen came about really because of our view that we believe that everybody should be able to enjoy and experience imaging and not only the sighted. So we, we're using and created an exhibition from a, a whole series of world-renowned photographers 
And using an elevated printing technique, uh, we're able to create a textured photography and imaging that enables people to experience imaging through 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 touch. It's quite fascinating when you talk about this because it, it does kind of go against the grain just a little bit, doesn't it? That, you know, of course, people think about photography, they think of it as a visual thing. But of course, it can be something that blind people can enjoy too. You're, of course, giving people that experience through tactile touch. Uh, how did that part come about? Because, it, like I say, it doesn't automatically uh, go together, does it? No, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not so obvious. And I think if I can touch on the technology because it's that element that really helps us to, to bring this to life. And I think we, we use a technology which we call a flatbed printer, uh, which is a very large device, you know, a production device for, it's normally used for creating signage and display graphics and points of sale. And I think many years ago, one or two creative and clever customers of ours realized that if you repeatedly print the same job on top of each other, then you create a textured surface. The, the ink is a UV cured ink, so it's very hard. So printing repeated layers enable them to kind of a trick to create a texture. And I think when our R&D guys saw this some years ago, we were inspired to think about how we could use this to create a tactile surface. And we then created some software, which has been through a number of you know, iterations. It's now called Prisma Elevate. But this software enables you to create the the tactile surface in a way that enables somebody to really experience an image in the right way and for it to be able to to tell those powerful stories or, or to communicate. So I, I suppose it was uh, serendipitous that you know, so some of our customers have been experimenting, and from that came this ability for us to be able to create some really amazing ways to use imagery to communicate. Matthew, is this, is this technique and this technology always intended for the accessibility side of things, or was it something else that's adapted and we've said, oh, wait a second, this can suddenly open photography up to a whole different audience? When we first saw the ability to create textures, I mean, there are a number of you know, elements that sprung to mind. You know, Braille was the first one because these devices and technologies had already been used for signage. And so, you know, immediately Braille in, in, in the sense of that type of accessibility was an immediate one. But then it's also been used for other purposes to create you know, textured surfaces that simulate, you know, interior decor, for example. But I remember many years ago, one of the first projects we did with this was with the Edvard Munch Museum in Oslo in Norway. And we created for, for children at that time textured replicas of the Edvard Munch uh, works of art. And what's really important, if you're recreating a fine art image, which is, you know, an oil painting in that in that case, just texturing the surface to mirror what the real artwork was. You're just, you're just looking at paint blobs. So, so what became apparent was the need to be able to elevate the print that helped tell the story, that told the story of the landscape or the characters in a particular, in a particular painting. And we've then developed that onwards in exactly the same way that we can now do with, with a photograph, that in the case of of Lawrence Gunther, who you're talking to um, today as well, was able to really feel and, and, and sense the texture of the skin of, of the rhino that's in, in the shot. You know, one of the, at that time, the last three southern um, white rhinos. And I think it's incredible to be able to then have people to be able to experience and really imagine it in a vivid way that scene and, you know, and to experience it. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's quite incredible. What you're saying here is very interesting because I have, to my left, it's just a shot on the camera, you wouldn't see it here, but I have my uh, Braille embosser, which is a very expensive printer, uh, which comes in at around $6,000, $7,000, depending on the one you buy, and that's in Canada, but of course that can go up to ten, even $15,000. Uh, have you stumbled onto something here that could essentially make this this process of printing, in this case, Braille, but also tactile images, bar charts, graphs, uh, images, all of that. C can you do that at a cheaper price? I'm, 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 and I'm talking here about consumers. 
Yeah, it's something that we, we have more than, I think, 8,000 of the flatbed printers installed around the world. And I think these these types of projects that we do, you know, are fantastic for us to be able to, you know, show the, the cutting edge of some of our technologies. But we also do them to, you know, inspire some of our customers as to ways that they can recreate that in their, in their own markets, in their own environment, so that they too can use the technology that they have to, um, you know, to, to inspire people and to use imaging to transform a world, not just in a visual sense, but in, in this tactile way. So, you know, the devices are very high-end production devices, but I think the nature of the number of them installed around the world, we certainly hope that this is something that, you know, printers all over the place will be inspired to think about how they could bring this into, into some of the things that they, that, that they output. Yeah, because this could be interesting to other people. I mean, this is what, again, I talk about this all the time, but mainstreaming this kind of technology, it can only be a good thing. And there's lots of people who may want to create tactile images. I mean, I think about people who print pictures of their pets or people who, you know, take pictures of family members. You know, that touch means everything to lots of people. It doesn't just mean something to blind people. Of course, us as blind people love it too. It, it, it gives us an image in our minds. But... If you can mainstream that, then it brings the overall cost down. Uh, it's not that I'm looking for a cheap printer here, Matthew, you understand. It's just that I, I, I just think, you know, the, the alternatives out there for blind people are so expensive. You might have touched upon something here which could deliver the same kind of experience to blind people as well as others at a reduced cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I certainly hope this is just really a start point to something that this type of technology can be used. And I think the more people use it, the more clever users will experiment and, and innovate in different ways to do it, different materials, you know, faster production processes, and, and making it you know, much more available. But I think one of the things that to me has really touched me about this whole, this whole project is the, uh, with, with the exhibition that we're putting on, is not only does that have the ability to experience imagery through through touch, but we also at the exhibition have a soundscape. We have the kind of braille that tells the story of the image. There's the tactile surface. So we're trying to find lots of different ways that people can experience this image and really have that vivid um, demonstration in, in their mind. But also at the exhibition, we're showing the, the prints from this range of you know, world famous photographers with an overlay on top of, of an acrylic print that actually gives sighted people who are at the exhibition a chance to experience what different types of visual impairments are like, whether it's from something like glaucoma or mm. you know, diabetic retinopathy. And, and to me, that is something that really helps you know, bring an appreciation to the, 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 the different types of, of visual impairment and you know, some of the challenges that go with that and to bring a new appreciation. But again, using imagery there to, you know, to raise awareness around accessibility, the importance of, of imagery in that context, as well as you know, providing this really uh, multi-sensory exhibition using sound and touch uh, as well. Matthew, Lawrence Gunther aside this, we're going to be talking to him. What has the response been from visitors to the exhibit so far? The, the exhibition actually opens uh, in a few days, uh, opened okay. on the 5th of April to the 7th. But, you know, we've, um, yeah, the, the videos are live on the Canon website now. We have a number of stories, so Lawrence's as well as uh, a, a few others. And, you know, I think I've probably watched the video with Lawrence probably more than 20 times during the production <laughs> process but also in in the kind of build up and in the preparations and i have to say it gets me it gets me every time because you know Lawrence i don't want to embarrass him but when from the moment he's on screen he strikes me as somebody who is um incredibly positive and uh you know and he's, he's somebody that you would you could learn from and spend time with he's passionate about his 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 conservation and i think when you then see him uh, you know, experiencing the image of the of one of the last three southern white rhinos, a topic that he's very passionate about. It's an incredible, and that that level of joy that he already had goes up to number eleven. And I think you can almost see him thinking about all of the possibilities for this. So it's a really powerful film. So they're already on the Canon website. 
you know, and I'm, you know, I can't wait personally for the for the exhibition that starts on the fifth of April at Somerset House because I really want to see both, you know, sighted visitors, you know, seeing and experiencing imagery through uh, through the eyes of of those partially sighted in different types of visual impairment, but also to see, uh, you know, other people. Uh, like Lawrence, who are experiencing the exhibition through touch and through sound, I think it's going to be really fantastic. So I'm certainly anticipating some some you know fantastic reactions. Are there any plans to expand this? Obviously, um, beyond just Europe. Yes, there are. Yes, we in the UK, where Canon Europe is based, we worked very closely with a UK organisation called the RNIB or the Royal, Royal National Institute for the Blind, and they really helped us put on this project and this exhibition in the right way but after the exhibition uh, finishes in london uh, it will be touring around europe and all of the different canon offices in canon countries around europe have their own activations their own exhibitions and they'll also be working with their own local equivalents of the organization that we worked with in the uk so again yeah a way for this to really travel around and to have the maximum impact it can both for local just... audiences, but as I said, also for our local you know, customer and user base who we really want them to pick up this thinking and these ideas and for it to be, you know, a part of uh, not just very special projects like museums where we've replicated paintings of, you know, Vermeer's Girl with the Pearl Earring or the Monk Museum, as I described earlier, but something that really uh, becomes, you know, a core part of how we expect to enjoy imagery. Yeah, and, and you know, it just makes this more accessible to all of us, which is wonderful. I, I do want to ask you, though, Matthew, just on a geeky point before we go, uh, because you're from Canon, I'm guessing you have the best webcam and the best looking setup we've ever had on he this does, TV Stephen, show. He does, Stephen, does. I was just I was like, what, what are you using? Because I, I want to know what the pros are using. What have you got in front of you there? Well, I won't tell you. I've spent four hours preparing for this, and, and I can tell you there's no makeup. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I, I use an EOS, an EOS camera, which when you plug it into your laptop, it becomes a, a webcam, and um, yeah, just I've shut the blind behind me. It's, that's about as much as I did. So I rely on Canon technology, of course. But, uh... <laughs> oh, of Matthew, course. Uh, Matthew, uh, thank you for joining us. The website again, canon-europe.com, right? Correct, yeah, and you'll find there the World Unseen project with all, all the videos and all the hub information about the exhibition for those in the UK, but also as it travels around Europe, uh, we'll, be, we'll be populating that with other other details as well but let us know if you need any connections here in canada to make sure that we uh, get the opportunity for our audience here to check it out as well yeah thank you i definitely will thank thanks so much so what's it like to experience this new technology and the exhibit well lawrence gunther mentioned him several times he's a host of ami's original podcast outdoors with lawrence gunther conservationist and he's joining us next here on access tech live as he went hands-on there's more Access Tech Live to come. Get involved and have your say at Access Tech Live on social media. We'll be right back. Access Tech Live will return in less than two minutes. Access Tech Live is in a commercial break. Access Tech Live will return in less than two minutes. Access Tech Live is in a commercial break. The show will return in less than a minute. Access Tech Live is in a commercial break. 
Access Tech Live will be back in 30 seconds. Tech Live, the latest in tech and accessibility with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. This is a whole new way of seeing. It's beautiful because you've got the textures, you've got the raised and lowered areas, but it's still a picture. I've never felt anything like this before in my life. But what I'm feeling here and the differences in the skin texture, it feels a lot like the animal. People are going to go nuts for this. You think so? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm so privileged to be here and experience this. Oh, man. This is my dream. Really? Oh, yeah. Welcome back to Access Tech Live. I'm Stephen Scott. Mark of Flalo is with me. Uh, that was Lawrence Gunther there, who hosts an AMI original podcast called Outdoors with Lawrence Gunther. Yeah, and he's the one who actually introduced me to this project, Stephen. I guess the embargo lifted, and he's like, I got to talk to Mark about this. And he sent me an email, <laughs> and I'm like, I got I to gotta learn more. And I, I said, Lawrence, and, and let's let's bring Lawrence on. Lawrence Gunther, obviously, th welcome to Access Tech Live. Uh, I, I shouldn't talk about you behind your back. That's extremely rude of me. But uh, <laughs> thank you so much for introducing us to this project, because not only did I want to get your perspective, obviously, going hands-on, but getting someone from Canon to understand what goes on behind the scenes sometimes really helps kind of set the stage for it. So what was that experience like? You know, I, I had no idea what to expect. You know, they, they contacted me out of the blue. I thought it maybe was a prank. You never know, right, when you get an email like that. And I said, oh, tell me more. That was the, my three-word reply. They sent me a non-disclosure agreement and a ticket to London. So off I went. Still had no idea because they wanted to capture everything sort of on camera without giving too much away. I never met the photographer until the cameras were rolling. I never touched anything until the cameras were rolling. Honestly, I thought I was going to feel, you know, a lifelike sort of 3D model of a rhinoceros. That that was my thinking on this. So what was the experience? What did you actually feel when you got there? Well, it was nothing like that at all. First, they had me re read some Braille that they made using this printing technology. And I tell you, it was some of the nicest Braille I've ever read. It was a beautiful dome top Braille, no sharp edges, big, you know, chunky Braille, grade one. So that works for me. And then we switched over to the uh, picture. And the first thing I touched, I said, wow, I said, that is really rough. And Brent, the photographer, said, he said, Lawrence, he said, that's exactly how the skin of a rhinoceros feels. And then I just went and moved my hand around. And I said, and I said, I see the guy with a gun. I said, was that the guy? Does that guy shoot the uh, rhinoceros? And he said, no, he's protecting him. There's three of them, rangers there, that are paid to protect this last living male northern rhinoceros. And, uh, and, and uh, so just exploring that picture and the details, you know, you talk about Easter eggs, Steve, and, and this picture had so many Easter eggs. I, you know, for half an hour, I kept finding Easter eggs. I go, oh, what's that? And what's that? Oh, look at that. What is this? You know, and it, it's just, it, you know, I used to be able to see when I was a kid, I, even though I was registered blind when I was eight, I had a fair bit of sight until I was in my early 20s, and I lost all my sight in my 40s. But this is almost like seeing as good as you can with your fingers. Now, Lawrence, you, you, you know, in the nature of your job, obviously, is talking about nature and animals. And there's a, there's a natural kind of obvious, let Lawrence, you know, feel the rhinoceros. What other type of experiences and images did they have on display that they let you feel? And what was that experience like? Were you able to decipher what it was? That was the only one I was able to touch. They had three other uh, uh, people with uh, vision loss and low vision blind uh, filming their videos, there was uh, I li I watched the videos. I don't know if they're all available now. I think they are, but there was yeah. a, a a woman there. She's pregnant uh, with low vision, and and they did an ultrasound, and then they took the picture of the ultrasound of her baby, and they used the technology to so she could feel the the face of her baby inside her stomach. Right, and that was powerful. Um, they had another uh, photographer who does 
you know, takes pictures of people with uh, disfigurements and makes them beautiful. And they had an influencer, uh, a, a blind influencer, feel that, and she was blown away. So uh, an Olympic athlete, one-armed swimmer, you know, just some amazing photographers, you know, providing, you know, just unique kinds of photographs. You would think, you know, it would be like, you know, the seven wonders of the world or something like that, right? No, no, this was... Uh, this was, you know, each each photographer and each picture was matched with the um, with the uh, the person who had the vision loss. So it was uh, it was pretty powerful. Everyone was meeting for the first time. And this has a, a deeper meaning in some ways, right? Because we've all had the tactile experience in our lives. Someone's maybe mm. put in front of us an image or a graph. Or I remember my first time ever getting hands-on with a tactile graph at school and thinking, wow, this is amazing. But the difference here is that this is actually showcasing not just the images being available in tactile form, but the technology that creates it. So in a way, what this is showing us is that more and more technology like this is coming out, and Canon is obviously at the forefront of this here, but it's kind of showing what is possible and can be created for more people. This, this is interesting, isn't it? Because it kind of goes beyond just the typical exhibition where maybe a few people get the chance to experience it and that's it. This could be something that one day we print out ourselves in our own home and try for ourselves. Oh, for sure, Stephen. And, and the nice thing is, and I, you know, is that the, the pictures we're feeling are still high definition, beautiful color, original photographs, right? Like it, you look at them with your eyes, you almost wouldn't know there's this raised component to it. And the raised area is only two millimeters high at its highest point. And then wow. they use different, you know, textures and different levels of height to indicate the foreground, the background. And, you know, of course, if you take a picture of a landscape or something, there's a lot of information. So there's some editing that takes place to, you know, more isn't always, you know, more, right? Sometimes you have to do a little less to for the things you want to pop, for them to be able to pop onto your fingers without getting lost in a, in, in a just a, you know, a, a mirage of, of all sorts of, of tactile imagery that you can't really make sense of. So... The way I think, Steve, if, if you did the chat GPT-4 with your uh, Be My Eyes app, and then you heard a little description of the picture, and then you put your hands on it, you would have, you know, the objective description from the AI, and then you would have your own subjective interpretation as if you were actually seeing it, you know, to the best of your ability with your fingers. But it, it, you can really start to visualize it and you understand what people see when they're looking now Lawrence you know sometimes we go to product launches they let you leave with a product clearly that wasn't the case with this but <laughs> should you should you um should you get your hands on a printer like this do you find do you think you'd find uses for it they sent me the picture not the original one but a, a slightly smaller one so I have it what about, here the, on my what desk. about the printer though <laughs> no, no. I said, I said, don't pay me. Just give me a printer, and they laughed. They said, <laughs> the printers are are cost between two hundred fifty thousand and seven hundred fifty thousand Canadian. Oh, wow. is that it? And, okay. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So this this is something. But you know what? To me, I think about a guide dog, and I've been using guide dogs since nineteen eighty six, and I always think, wow, you know, people give so much money for blind people to have pets. You know, no, okay, it's guide dogs. Sorry, I didn't say the word pets, but, <laughs> you know, face it, it's great to have a dog. I love having a dog. So to me, it's like just, hey, man, someone's paying me, someone's paying a huge amounts of money for me to have a dog that I can just get around with. I think this is as fundamental as as that, you know, that there needs to be a service where someone's going to print pictures or where we can send our digital images and say, here, hey, here's a picture of my new grandchild. I, here's a picture of my kids. Here's a Christmas yeah. picture. I, I want these on the, my desk, right? I, I want, you know, this is my favorite lake. I want a picture of my favorite lake. This is a satellite image of my, my favorite lake. I want a picture. This is my house, you know? What does my house look like? Things like that. We should be able to send these images in and, and get these prints out. And the nice thing is, because they're not 3D models, you're not going to have to erect, you know, thousands of feet of shelving in your <laughs> home space. <laughs> you know, you can make a photo album with this stuff, right? You can literally make a photo album and, and not clutter up your entire house with 3D models. 
That's so cool. Lawrence, thank you for taking, obviously, thank you for introducing us to this program in the first place. And thank yeah. you for coming on and telling us from your perspective what it was like. It was super interesting. And, and I can't wait to see this technology get a little bit more consumer friendly because we're going to, I think, get to the point where we will be able to send these type oh, yeah. of things off to get printed. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, look, when OCR came out in the mid 80s, it was $15,000, $20,000, right? And look, it's free now on your phone. So it, yeah, we'll get there. That's so true. That is Lawrence Gunther. You can subscribe to his podcast, Outdoors with Lawrence Gunther, wherever you get your podcasts. Of course, with new episodes dropping every two weeks with a new one just, just around the corner. Uh, your questions or your answers to our question of the day are coming up in just a moment. And that question is, what is the strangest thing you've captured on your home security cameras? We'll take a quick break and come back with those answers. This is Access Tech Live. There's more Access Tech Live to come. Get involved and have your say at Access Tech Live on social media. We'll be right back. Access Tech Live will return in less than two minutes. Access Tech Live is in a commercial break. Access Tech Live will return in less than two minutes. Access Tech Live is in a commercial break. The show will return in less than a minute. Access Tech Live will be back in 30 seconds. Tech Live, the latest in tech and accessibility with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. And as we wrap things up here on Access Tech Live, we're going to get to your question of the day in just a moment and some of your answers to that. But uh, Mark, we've been talking a lot about this World Unseen exhibition and of course the wonderful work Canon's done. Maybe it's uh, a good idea for us to remind people of the website to go look at those videos that Lawrence was talking about. Yeah, and the videos are quite emotional and quite good. Uh, Canon-Europe or hyphen Europe Dot com. You can head on over there and you'll see the world unseen. Pretty emotional stuff when you see people reacting for the first time. When Lawrence said, you know, you sign this NDA and you kind of go go to London unseen. I mean, there's a reason for that because they want to capture the natural the natural reaction, which is which is pretty cool. Stephen, you, you and I off the air, I was asking you how many cameras you have in your house. Like, my house is covered in cameras, but you have no idea what's on them. No, you know, if anything happens, I just take the box, I unplug it, I give it to the police and let them work it out. Uh, thankfully, nothing's happened yet though, that needs that. So, But, you know, it's funny because we all have these ring doorbell cams or equivalents on our front doors. And honestly, I could be capturing aliens landing from another planet and I wouldn't know. I just, oh, there's motion at the front door. There we go. Uh, and that's it. Well, you care about that, right? Motion at the front door. Who, ca yeah. you know, who cares if it's E.T. or not? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if they've got fast food, that's all I'm interested in. E.T. Oh, bring Lord. fast food. That's all I want. So what is the strangest thing you've captured on your home security cameras? Got a couple answers here. Uh, Lauren wrote in on our social media, which is at, at Access Tech Live. It goes like, when I caught a squirrel chewing through our power line? Well, that's, that's oh. Lauren. Yes, that's exactly the kind of thing you want to see on your... This is like America's Funniest Home Videos, but the uh, <laughs> Access Tech Live edition, okay? 
Um, we got another one here from Barry. He wrote, I once came home only to see the remnants of police tape. Oh, boy. Uh, when I checked wow. my cameras, I saw a burglar clearly running from something, getting tackled and arrested by police. That's the kind of thing I would have hoped to see live, to be perfectly honest. But I guess after the fact, it's it's kind of funny as well. Um, Elena wrote, I once saw footage of a black cat trying its darndest to climb out of our yard on the fence. After about 40 minutes and many more attempts than I could count, it finally gave up and scurried off camera. So, listen, I got Aww. squirrels in my backyard all the time. You know, Stephen, there's a funny story that I actually told this morning with, uh, with Dave Brown, which is my camera has actually caught some vandals. Um, I didn't even know what happened, to be perfectly honest, till the police ring my doorbell. That's startling incident number one. And they said, hey, I noticed some cameras around your house. Can you take a look? I remember the, the look on their face when they walked into my basement and they saw my eight security cameras on this <laughs> elaborate setup. They're like, what do you what do you do? I'm like, oh, well, no, don't worry. I broadcast. It's fun. But we actually had footage that led them to the arrest of these people. So, you know, oh. there's a lot of arguments and questions about, you know, the use, the positive and negatives about security cameras. But I think especially in the outdoors of your house, you know, other than the, the voyeurism element of it, you can definitely catch things that go on. Like people avoid my house when there were burglaries, you know, cars were broken into and I can clearly see someone not coming to my house, probably because they saw the array of cameras that were on the front. That's right. Big lights, LEDs, barking dogs. You know, I think basically what I'm getting from you is don't come near my house. That's the sense I'm getting. Yeah, I mean, we had a couple cameras inside the house, but I'm not allowed telling the stories of what it caught just because it might embarrass oh. my wife and some other people that are involved. That's a divorce, so, yeah. Uh, don't want uh, that. Yeah, there might, there might be an imminent divorce. It wasn't threatened directly, Stephen, but let's just say Never we'll is. stick to outdoor cameras. Okay, my kids aren't babies anymore. It's not baby monitor time anymore. Mm. It's just time to capture yeah, what's yeah, going yeah. on. Do, do do let us know, of course, uh, at Access Tech Live. Send us video. Like, it'll be fun to actually throw a couple of videos up there. But uh, I'm definitely it's, not... Don't you find that on social media, that's all you find nowadays are people... I saw one the other day of a dog that was frantically trying to ring the doorbell. It managed to ring the doorbell by itself and then was completely bamboozled by the sound, kind of nodded its head <laughs> side to side, and then just barked at the end, which really made me laugh. Um, this is, like isn't the this what social panda. media was meant for? Dog, dog exactly. memes and photos sneezing and pandas. like that? A sneezing what? The sneezing panda. You've got to remember the sneezing panda. Come on, that was famous. I don't. I I'll don't send you after. I'll send you after the show. So if, if you've got a funny one, let us know. Shoot us an email. Uh, feedback at accesstechlive.com. Maybe we'll show it if you give us permission. We can actually show it on the air on a future episode. Uh, Stephen, you know, thanks to all our guests who are on the show this week. Lord Gunther, of course, Matthew from Canon, and of course, Julia from uh, CSUN, which we'll be talking about next week with some people on yeah. site and for the next couple of weeks. So uh, on behalf of everybody here on today's show and at Access, Access Tech Live, I'll get it out. Uh, thanks for being with us. We'll catch Bye -bye. you next week. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Access Tech Live. Follow us online on all social media at Access Tech Live. Email us feedback at accesstechlive.com. Hosted by Stephen Scott in Glasgow and Marka Flalo in Montreal. Written by Stephen Scott and Marka Flalo. Producer, Marka Flalo. Director, Dan Panamondo. Technical Director, Caitlin Robinson. Audio, Jordan Mulgrave. Live graphics and playback, Kingsley Juco. Graphics Coordinator, Eliza Rocco. Integrated Described Video Specialist, M. Williams. Supervising Producer, Michelle Dudas. Produced in collaboration with Aflalo Communications, Inc. and Double Tap Productions. Copyright 2024, Accessible Media, Inc. An AMI Original Production.